Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation to speak to this incredibly important and interesting uh, gathering. Um, it turned out I happened to be in Dublin today, and so I was asked to speak for about 10 minutes. Um, so I didn't present, produce any slides. Um, I have uh, I've, uh, a lot to cover, so I'm very grateful for the slightly extra bit of time, but I won't uh, uh, subject you to yet another PowerPoint presentation in the process. Um, as uh, was kindly said in the introduction, I, I am the chairman of the Natural Capital Committee uh, in uh, England, and we are the first natural capital committee in the world, uh, and we are now in our second term, so we have a good four years of uh, work behind us and uh, consideration of the issues. Uh, we are an independent committee. Uh, it's crucial that we report to the Economic Subcommittee of the Cabinet, not to the Environment Ministry. So we do have a lot to do with the Environment Ministry, but also the Treasury. And that reflects the fact that uh, in the arguments between environmentalists and conventional economic policy makers, the, the distance between those two has been closed and that in what we're doing, it's accepted that natural capital and the environment is part of the economy and not some added on extra luxury which can be afforded in the good times uh, provided everybody else is satisfied uh, with their consumption beforehand. Um, so what I'd like to do in the uh, time available to me is first of all say a few words about the natural capital concept itself and how it differs from sustainability and uh, some of the what I would call hard and rigorous components which come with the natural capital agenda. I'd like to say a few words of warning about how what is now become uh, from a peripheral concept to central to environmental arguments, some of the risks that come uh, from natural capital being interpreted in lots of different and pluralistic ways. And I want to contrast what we're trying to do in natural capital with the way in which sustainability has in many cases morphed into greenwash and almost uh, meaningless uh, concepts as opposed to hard outcomes. I want to say a few words about how you do it and I'll say that largely from the perspective of a country but um, uh, it also has a corporate component and indeed we have published a corporate template for natural capital accounting which is not the same as the protocol it's uh, uh, the Natural Capital Committee's view about how to do that from a corporate perspective. And that's a corporate perspective, not just from companies, but any corporate organization. So I want to say uh, something about how to do it uh, from a country perspective. Ireland is a great country to think about. It's a tractable uh, domain. Natural capital is absolutely essential to its economic activity. And it's a very plausible uh, uh, case study of how to start to build a proper balance sheet, uh, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment. And then I want to turn to um, what we're doing in the Natural Capital Committee itself and tell you a little bit about the progress we've made. And I will end up by saying a little bit about Brexit, because of course, when you look at uh, uh, Britain, uh, Europe is environment. Uh, CAP is still 40% of the total EU budget, it was 80%, and environmental regulation, environmental rules, environmental policy are perhaps the most uh, important and serious ways in which membership of, uh, of, of the community acts and of course um, raises a whole set of issues in respect of Brexit, for which the natural capital 25-year plan is the natural framework of thinking about how to move on uh, after Britain leaves uh, the EU. So that's my canvas. I'll try to cover it pretty quickly. Um, uh, much of the material is uh, in the publications of the Natural Capital Committee. And uh, if I'm permitted a 10-second advert, while I chaired the first Natural Capital Committee, 
I tried to write up the concepts in a book about natural capital, which would be accessible to um, uh, uh, the widest possible public. And uh, for the slides, I've done a number of presentations on natural capital, so if you really do want some PowerPoints and can't resist the temptation, you want your fix, there's some on my website that you can find. So let's start with the top of this, the natural capital concept and what it stands for. And there are basically two things right at the top which one has to have in mind. The first thing is natural capital is all about capital of which one sort is natural. It's about human capital, natural capital, and physical capital all being considered as core inputs into a productive economy. So it says you cannot think about economic production, national income accounts, all that kind of stuff, economic policy, unless you think about capital, physical capital, labor, and the environment. It's not an add-on. And that, uh, economists have been saying for a long time, economics is the study of the allocation of scarce resources. There isn't much scarcer than our atmosphere and our biodiversity. It's crucial. It's integrated. And the revolution that follows from that, which is changing all economic policy to take account of the environmental dimensions and the positive contributions to human welfare that come from managing natural capital properly, that revolution is only just beginning but it's absolutely critical. And if it isn't one, we won't get through this century. It's pretty simple. We're going to have 10, 12 billion people on the planet by the middle of the century at a GDP growth rate of about 3% per annum. Globally, the world economy will be consuming 16 times at minimum of what it currently consumes. And if you think about all the housing stock and everything else that goes with that, uh, it's not hard to work out that unless we take the environment seriously, biodiversity, loss of half the species, and climate change will get us. So this isn't an add-on. This is an ultimate challenge for humans on this planet to integrate the environment into the economy. And if you look at the UK end, well, you know, 10 million more people within the next 20 years uh, at three-point-something occupancy rate. That's another three million houses on top of 200,000 a year, plus all the infrastructure and everything that goes with it. Unless we do that in a sensible, environmentally uh, constrained way, um, the effects will be permanent and extremely damaging. But there are lots of upsides, lots of opportunities in natural capital. It's a positive, valued input into the economy, we should take it that way. That's the first point. The second point is a very radical point. Natural capital is about assets. It's not about, it's not a measure of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services derive from assets, but it's about the assets themselves. So we think about a society in which we provide a set of capital assets so people can exploit the opportunities that are in front of them. Whether they do or not, it's an additional point. For those of a philosophical bent, this is essentially a March Sen's concept of capabilities as opposed to utility. We want to make sure people have an education so they can make their choices. That's human capital. We want to make sure that there's a railway system, that there's a transport system, an electricity system, a broadband system. It would be nice if we had a broadband system um, in order for them to be able to function the economy. We want a set of environmental assets valuable in their own right as part of that economy. And that's where we get to the accounting side of this. So if you want to think about assets, you have to have an asset register. You have to know what you've got. And remarkably, if you ask what has, I don't know, England or Ireland got, you will have a very crude quantitative list at best of its natural capital. So you need an asset register. You need to identify within the asset register which are renewables and which are non-renewables, and then you have to sort out which of the renewable assets are assets at risk, and that's where the science, the thresholds, etc., which Cathy and others no doubt have talked about today, uh, come into play. These assets go into a balance sheet. There is no country in Europe that has a balance sheet at all. Isn't that stunning? GDP is a cash concept. We don't actually know what assets we've got or liabilities, pension liabilities, public debt, and all those kind of things drawn together in national accounts. Well, we need one. We need it to think about physical infrastructure as well as environmental infrastructure. And that naturally leads us on to the idea that 
if we want to maintain the set of natural capital intact, we have to use capital maintenance. So you can't just let natural capital look after itself. You have to spend what's necessary to at least maintain it intact if your objective is the minimum one of not letting natural capital decline. And that means no depreciation of these assets. They're there in perpetuity, unlike buildings and shops and computers and cars and the things that are on a normal company balance sheet. These are assets in perpetuity. They require capital maintenance. So you need a balance sheet with an asset register, with assets at risk, identifying the thresholds. You need to work out how much capital maintenance required to keep them intact. And then after that, you can declare what your national budget is or is not after you've maintained them. In the same way as you ought to declare what is the capital maintenance necessary to keep your water system running, your electricity system running, your transport system running. And deduct that first as capital maintenance before you declare whether Ireland's got a surplus or deficit, whether Britain's deficit is minus 5% of GDP or 15 or 20% or whatever. What it tells you immediately when you think about balance sheets, assets and capital maintenance is that the stated deficits of the major economies in Europe are almost meaningless. They do not tell you the state of the economy. You can privatize loads of assets, pretend you've got loads of cash, and claim you've got lots of economic growth. Witness GB in the last 25 years. Hmm? Anyway, that, that's the way GDP counts work. Everything's cash. Assets, completely different. Okay? Now, if you think about a balance sheet, and by the way, you don't have to have a perfect balance sheet tomorrow, but if you start with precisely the wrong answer, no balance sheet, being roughly right, even if you do partially, just to add some assets in, we could have an account for North Sea oil and gas. That would have improved the position. So it's an incremental process, highly practical. Start with the woodlands, start with your national parks, start with uh, a whole host of easy to grasp assets and then expand through time. Better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Now, the principle which I enumerate in my book is an aggregate natural capital rule in fact, there are two rules, and I won't define them precisely for you, about what it is you can do with renewables and non-renewables in order to maintain the set of assets intact through time. Now, I suspect all of us in this room know that the current situation is not an optimal one. We have done an enormous amount of damage, and therefore a lot of damage to people by damaging the natural capital over the 20th century. So I think most people would accept that whatever the right level of natural capital is, the current level is the wrong level. And so the question is how to enhance the natural capital, not simply to do the capital maintenance. So on top of the capital maintenance, you want to add enhancement. And my natural capital rules describe how you do that for the returns from the non-renewables, like oil and gas, et cetera, things you're only going to use once, somebody's got to use them, but what compensation you make, and the renewables, which you want to provide economic benefits forever and therefore you need to maintain. So if you want to improve, then the question is, which bits of natural capital should you pick as the most important first things to do to make the natural capital stock higher? Now, of course, every environmental group's got their own preference. If you ask my Wildlife Trust, of which I'm a vice president, very proud to be so, I'll tell you exactly where on the Thames you should improve the natural capital. And I'll produce you a really good argument as to why that will reduce flooding in Oxford, why you don't need to spend uh, more than 100 million on a, a, a concrete channel around Oxford relief flooding. Let us buy some more land, let us flood it in winter, let us create some wildlife habitat. It's a lot cheaper, I'll tell you that. Now, if I ask the uh, bug life what they should do, they would have a very good plan for butterflies. So we'll all have our plans. The answer is you have to do a forensic examination of what the economic benefits are to society of the different projects available to improve and rank them accordingly. So this is all doable. This is all practical. These are the kind of steps you have to make. Now, just to make two other points. One is this differs from sustainability. Sustainability started off as a very good idea. But when you learn that the national planning rules in Britain to speed up building in Britain 
include sustainable development as one of the criteria, you realize that what was a good concept has become almost completely vacuous, indeed worse, because it's tagged on by all sorts of companies and governments, provided you put the development bit in and you put a few weights elsewhere, anything passes the test. I would argue natural capital is a hard concept, conceptually hard, I've tried to indicate some of the things you have to do to do it properly, and I would argue that sustainability has become a woolly concept. And I think it's very, very important, the environmental movement, I don't mean with any disrespect, grows up and engages in hard analysis. Accountancy isn't just for businesses, it's for the environment. We should really apply the techniques and get on with it. Now, I promise to say a few words, and I will in conclusion, about what we're up to in the Natural Capital uh, Committee. So we're in the second Natural Capital Committee. Uh, the first one uh, ran for three years, and basically it was about defining the concepts, sorting out how to measure natural capital, and setting out the framework for thinking about it. In our third report, the State of Natural Capital, um, report which was published at the beginning of 2015, there is, I think, a pretty concise summary of the concepts. I've tried to make it more intelligent in my book, but we tried to bring that together. We had uh, what I, the person I regard as the best finance uh, professor in Britain, who'd never really done any work on the environment, the best, uh, one of the best um, uh, professors of ecology and biodiversity, Georgina Mace at UCL, and we put them together with others, uh, Ian Bateman uh, uh, from Exeter, to think through the concepts. And we spent three years getting that right. And I feel very strongly that we've set out the templates, we've engaged with the Office of National Statistics, we've started to create the national income accounts. That is the right way to do it. But the problem about getting the concepts right is we've all been measuring things for a long time, and we can all tell you the decline of whatever it is that we're most concerned about. Um, uh, um, and um, it's a sorry tale for most species, not all, but most, and most ecosystems, and we all know what agriculture has done. So for phase two, and I would, this sounds immodest, but I think I would claim some credit for this, we came up with the notion that since the government was committed to leaving the environment in a better state than it found it, they should have a generational plan. And I personally persuaded each of the major political parties before the last election to put in their manifesto that they were committed to a 25-year environment plan to leave the environment in a better shape than it is now. Because it's 25 years ahead and they'll either be dead or out of office, they found it rather easy to commit to that. And that's a piece of advice in public policy, okay? That's how the euro happened, okay? Put it further enough out in the far future and people will sign up to something that's in the public good perhaps, and then work back. So the next stage, having had an electoral success and the previous Prime Minister being deeply committed to natural capital, um, uh, I don't know what the current Prime Minister's position is, but she's not been there very long. Um, the next step was to turn it into something practical. So if you send politicians off to do a 25-year plan, they will do one of two things. Well, they do both, actually. First of all, they write down all the things they're currently doing and call it a plan. And the second thing they'll do is write down a load of aspirations which are way into the future, which don't mean anything and can't be measured. And that's exactly what they'll do. So I suggested that instead of that, we should have four, they were called um, case studies, but then they were called pathfinders. And then apparently the previous Secretary of State thought that pathfinders were things that Boy Scouts did, but pioneers were things that Girls Guides did. So they're now called pioneers. Um, one is a river catchment. You take an entire catchment and you apply the natural capital way of thinking, the balance sheet, etc., to that. Another is a city, another is a marine area, and another is a landscape restoration. And these are not just examples. These are meant to be templates for every river catchment, templates for every city, for every restoration period uh, project and every marine area. And uh, the Secretary of State wrote to me formally uh, two weeks ago and announced the four pioneers, and now we're engaged in that. We're doing lots of other things. We're trying to define what the environment should look like in 25 years' time. We're creating a how-to-do-it manual for all the people who'd like to take the concepts and take them forward. And we will give, being given advice on aspects of environmental policy as asked by the various secretaries of state, including, no doubt, CAP and Bretex. Um, but the final thing, and this is absolutely crucial, we have 
the terms of reference duty to report on the government's progress with the 25-year plan. They don't know what they've done. Because we will report on progress. And progress may accelerate now. Some things are being done. But we are independent. And we will report on whether they are or not achieving that. And here's the final twist. If you get the Office of National Statistics to produce natural capital accounts, and they have done, they've started to do it, they're partial. They statistically show that natural capital is going down. There is no escape for a government that's committed to improving it if the official statistics point to a different direction. So again, it's a hard concept. If you try to be woolly about natural capital, say, that's a great idea, we're all in favor of it, etc., which I'm sure we all are, you don't get traction. You get traction with hard accounts, with national accounts, embedding it in national income accounts. What I would say to you in conclusion, taking natural capital seriously because the state of our environment this century is just too serious to lead it to people, who, great people who campaign. We've got to get it into the fabric of how economic policy works. Otherwise, it's going to be a hot and a future without many birds to go bird watching to have a look at. Thank you very much. Paddy Woodworth from the Natural Capital Steering Committee. Thank you for a very interesting, very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, if I'm quoting you accurately towards the beginning, you said that natural capital is part of the economy. Is it not more true and more powerful to put it the other way around, that the economy is a subset of natural capital and simply cannot exist without it? And my second question, which maybe you answered towards the conclusion, is how do we avoid natural capital, ecosystem goods and services, all this new language, becoming as empty as you rightly say sustainability has become today? Okay. The, the, the second part of your question, um, and forgive me, I thought I answered, which is that the way you do it is to do the numbers, do the accounting. Do not accept half-baked reports about people saying this is natural capital and that isn't. Measure it. Okay? And, I, I, for example, you, you know, for many environments, it's just glaze over when I start talking about how you do accounting, capital maintenance, historic cost, national income statistics. Well, this really matters. You don't glaze over if you're running a financial institution about these numbers and your depreciation number. You don't uh, glaze over if you're chief executive of Shell. And you don't glaze over if you're chancellor of the exchequer. So that's the answer to your second question. Okay, and it, I mean, it's going to be difficult and tough because some people are doing stuff which, you know, is going to have to be told it's wrong. Okay, it's just not the right way to do these things. It's woolly. And I really worry about the bandwagon that's developing of everyone wants to do national, natural capital. Great if they do it properly. Bad news if they don't. Okay, on the part of the economy, I mean, this is a philosophical point, okay? But my response to this is the following, okay? Um, it's true that we're all products of nature. My ideas about natural capital are the function of an evolutionary process which would produce my brain which thinks these things. But so what? Diamonds are a product of volcanic activity, etc. The question is, given what we are, given that most economic activity now is the application of ideas, and ideas are separate from assets, which assets within the framework would you want to concentrate on? Which assets give you potentially the highest benefits? And which assets are most at risk? So if you take, say, shoals of herring, a classic example in the North Sea of something which is a renewable natural capital asset, okay? it will go on producing herrings for the next 100,000 years if we don't, to use a technical term, bugger it up. All right? Okay? Above that threshold, it doesn't matter, it'll just keep doing it. We can harvest a certain amount. Below that, we lose the benefit, not just for now, but forever. And that's where he, conventional economics misses out. It's the integral of the value of that service for infinity, effectively, of our time on this planet, probably. Okay? Now, that's where you want to spend your time. So, in some sense, you can have a philosophical debate, and I'm really interested in that. 
but I'm also interested in practically, given where we are, given the structure of our economies, what should we do now? And what I'm saying is the economic benefits, the economic return, the sustainable economic growth from treating natural capital seriously, the gains are enormous. And there's nothing wrong with economic growth. Technical progress goes on. Environmentalists who say we don't want economic growth, A, they live in a world which is never going to happen, but B, it's not right. You know, I did my thesis on a typewriter. I've got a powerful computer in my pocket. That's growth. But it's got to be sustainable economic growth after capital maintenance, after the profit asset value, from a balance sheet measure of economic growth, not GDP. Um, Raoul MP with a slightly woolly business name, Sustaneo. Apologies for that. Um, I have two questions, a positive and a negative. So I'll start with the negative. Us humans have been phenomenally successful at sort of um, procreating ourselves across the globe, and, and that's growing. Does natural capital just buy us more time? So at the end of the game, we're left with a bigger problem. And will we keep on eating all the grass until it's gone anyway? Mm -hmm. And the positive one is, can you give us an elevator pitch? What's in it for me if we're to pitch this to organizations that don't understand what natural capital is? Okay, right. So the, the, the first one, um, again, it's a deeply philosophical question. Are we doomed? Are humans actually doomed to do what biology determines, which is to breed until they reach the limits and then Malthus drops in and uh, uh, annihilates us, okay? I have no idea. Um, there are times at three o'clock in the morning it scares the hell out of me, right? But to be honest, there is nothing I can do about it, right? Short of introducing population control, okay? And when you confront a country like China, which until six months ago was forcing women up to six months pregnant to have compulsory abortions, you have to ask yourself very carefully how you're going to think through. Nobody has managed a population control policy that I can think of, but maybe they can. Okay, uh, but I would say in the pessimistic mode, there is not much evidence that developing countries are going through the demographic trans uh, transition. The reason the world population estimates for later on this century have been increased from 9 billion to up to 12 billion is because African women are not following the pattern of European women, which is as wealth increases, they are not reducing their family size. And this is not just a question of infant mortality. This assumption that if you're rich, you'll have less children is no, nothing more than an assumption, okay? So, in some sense, I just want to know what I can do now, and I can't solve that. On the what's in it for me, but it's enormous, right? Look, look at the economic benefits that flow. Imagine if you have, as a, one idea I'm very keen on is that every child should be within 500 meters of a green space. Think how much more healthy they will be. Think what the natural environment could do. Think of, look, look around you. Look at the economic waste. Look at the obesity. Look at the health problems we suffer from. Look at the air quality. These are all tangible economic improvements which include, increase people's well-being, including yours. So last night I came to Dublin and I went for a run around the city because I had a race coming up, okay? And I inhaled the air. It's a hell of a lot better than Oxford or London, but it's horrible, okay? My welfare would go up for me Having more cyclists, they were demonstrating up Upper Merion Street when I came into town. Having more cyclists is a net improvement, okay? We know nature is good for people. Just because it doesn't have a price traded in the market doesn't mean it isn't a good economic policy. And we have to get off the defensive bit about stop killing off nature. Look, let's improve it. This is good for people. This is great economic benefit in conventional economic thinking. Hello, is it working? Yeah. Uh, I've been told to be quite sure. Um, I'm Patrick Breslin from Trinity College, Dublin. Um, so basically my point is there's been some discussion of philosophy and a lot of discussion uh, about economics and this idea of getting the um, measurements right. And if we can measure things right, we can make more rational decisions. But what seems to be missed out in this is that economies are not just economies, but political economies. That there are... Mm -hmm. Just as a, as a small example, in this context, and, and where we are in Ireland at the moment, very recently there was a tax bill to Apple that was 13 billion yep. uh, euros, which would have gone a long way to preserving a lot of natural capital, yep. investing in water infrastructure, X, Y, and Z. But there are quite specific uh, political economic relationships that are working there. 
And so what I'm not convinced by is how natural capital as an economic tool effectively will address those types of relationships and those types of dynamics. Okay. In fact, I'm quite worried about how it could work within those types of dynamics. Okay, I'll give you two arguments. A conceptual argument, which is, and we can argue about it philosophically and in political economy terms. I think the right way to think about human welfare and society is from a capabilities perspective, not a utility perspective. I think in terms of people's rights, entitlements, the assets that should be available for them to make the kinds of choices they want to make. It's a version of Sen's approach, but only a particular version. Now, you may have a different philosophical position, and I believe political positions ultimately derive from views about ethics. Okay? But my ethics is not conventional neoclassical economics. But we can argue about that and the components and the distribution of the benefits and whether it should be inner city poorer areas that we give the green spaces to first because we want to bias towards people who are less well off. We can do that, okay? And I'm very happy with my natural capital concept on that basis and that's what I'm working on next which is a more philosophical book about the role of assets and the next generation and the entitlements to it. But I come back to you on another point which you may think is unfair. Look, it isn't working what we're doing now. We've had all these arguments. We have all these arguments about the politics of the environment. The truth is, sadly, certainly in, in, in my experience of Britain is, people don't care very much about it. They don't even know. I was explaining to my student the other day that you couldn't de deal, you couldn't trade off swallows against iPads or iPods or whatever the things were called, right? iPhones, right? That you couldn't just substitute one sort of capital and another. He said to me, what, what do you mean by a swallow? So I said, could you identify a swallow? <laughs> no idea. Absolutely no idea. And, you know, you, we all think that we know about the environment, okay? The knowledge of natural history is just incredibly low. And if you've never seen a swallow, you won't miss it, right? And this is really true. You, do, you, cannot, you cannot underestimate the degree of, I would say ignorance, but it's not a, 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 a uh, not describing fault, it's just lack of knowledge of people. And if you don't know anything about it, I used to think green environments were good ones. Now I realize they're mostly deserts of, of monoculture with single crops and everything else has been killed. I used to think that conifer woodlands, well, that's woodlands, that's good. I now appreciate that's not necessarily right. So the knowledge base is very restricted, and what we are actually achieving on the environment is going backwards. And the maximum the current approach to the environment is achieving is slowing down the speed we're going backwards. Look at climate change. We can't cobble together a solution at two degrees, so hey, the target will be 1.5, and we think that's a triumph. Germany thinks it's doing its energy vendor as a political gesture. It's been a massive dash for coal. It's built 13 gigawatts of new coal and opened lignite mines up. It's not working, okay? So what the natural capital idea does is make this tough, make natural assets important, it integrates them into the discussion, and I am in that respect, even though I'm philosophically in a particular position and other people take different views, I am hopelessly pragmatic. I cannot bear the idea that my children, and now I have a grandchild from last week, will inherit a world which is going down the particular path it's going to at the moment, and there will be very little natural environment left for her going into the future. We have to do better than we've done so far, and I genuinely believe the natural capital concept, because it's hard, because it's engaged, because it's difficult, because it can be measured, will make a difference. May fail, but um, I think it's worth trying.